All right. Good morning, everyone. Um, hello to the Internet Governance Forum. Um, it's my first time here, so I'm really excited, and I'm excited to meet you all. Um, welcome to the workshop on strengthening a multi-stakeholder approach to international norms in cyberspace. My name is Julia. With me um, is Laura, Natalie, um, and Kate. We are um, from Stiftung Neue Verantwortung, the German Marshall Fund, and the EU ISS. And we're working on a project, um, uh, the EU Cyber Direct, the European Commission project um, on cyber diplomacy. So we have from different angles to do with international norms um, and cybersecurity policy. And we wanted to lose, use this forum to engage with more stakeholders from academia to tech community, civil society, the private sector, government, think tankers, you name it, who are now in the room from, from all over the world. Um, this will be an interactive workshop, so we are uh, looking forward to really engaging in a discussion. And uh, yeah, I'll hand it over to Natalie, who did most of the preparation here, and I'll see you all in the group work again. Thank you, Julia, uh, for the introduction. And thanks, everyone, for being here, uh, having lasted through the queue. Uh, I think we're all uh, aware now of uh, the great queuing system of uh, the German uh, government. Um, um, so what we wanted to talk about today is um, the concrete actions that all stakeholders um, take in the, the UN norms debate. Now, to kind of get a baseline level, who here has heard of the UNGG norms? All right, that's half, so that's, that's good. Um, it's, it's, uh, right now, um, there's so many agreements happening, uh, so many actions being taken on uh, establishing responsible behavior in cyberspace, um, and one of those processes is at the UN. Um, now, in 2015, um, there has been what we call like a landmark report uh, called the UNGG uh, 2015 report. Um, and we wanted to focus on this one specifically um, because it contains uh, uh, a lot of norms that, that come back in most agreements. Um, so what we want to do today is look at four of those UNGG norms and see how um, not just states but also other stakeholders are involved in this. Um, and there's a lot of talk now of, of how can we implement those norms, um, but there's not a lot of thinking of what does that mean to implement a norm? What does it mean to interact with that norm? Um, so for that purpose, we've um, identified five roles that stakeholders usually have in these processes. Um, we'll, we'll see this uh, um, in our workshop as well, what those five roles are. Um, but traditionally, there's um, usually a role for uh, um, every stakeholder from private sector, uh, civil society, academia, technical community, and of course, public sector, um, to influence uh, the opinion, to make sure that uh, the norm uh, uh, and the idea of what this norm is supposed to be um, gets influenced, that there is a, a, a debate around it. So there's uh, influencing opinion. Then there's rulemaking, um, and this is sometimes the only focus uh, uh, in this whole debate. What are the rules? Um, but it's not the only uh, uh, thing that exists. So states do establish rules, but just because states do this doesn't mean uh, no one else can get involved in this. So rulemaking is something that not just states uh, can be involved in. Uh, then there is problem solving. Uh, often this is something that is uh, in the technical field uh, only described, ascribed to the technical community. But there's a role for, for everyone. There's a role for civil society, there's a role for academia um, to also be a problem solver and to come up with solutions um, to actually make sure these norms are followed. Um, then there's uh, uh, community building, setting up a trusted channel, making sure that uh, the community of people are all involved, making sure that there is multi-stakeholder interventions. Um, so community building. And as last, uh, we uh, defined uh, norm observation, whistleblowing, uh, making sure that a norm is actually followed. So this sounds very vague, eh? uh, uh, implementing norms, norms op observation. Uh, so we wanted to go down a bit more concrete and we'll be uh, handling four specific norms of the UNGG. Um, so after uh, I've finished here, I would like to ask to divide yourself um, to the norm that you feel that you have interacted with uh, in your capacity, um, that you feel that your organization should be interacting with, um, but see certain challenges, um, and that you uh, would like to know how can you start interacting with this uh, uh, and exchanging some best practices with other stakeholders. 
So um, the four norms uh, that we're going to discuss, uh, first of all, is uh, the human rights norm. And my colleague Kate, uh, if you can stand up, Kate, uh, uh, will be moderating this with uh, some input uh, from Leandro uh, Uzveri from the uh, ADC. Um, I'll let uh, Kate and Leandro introduce themselves uh, during the workshop. Um, but the idea is that this norm is about how um, states respect human rights uh, when they uh, uh, govern the internet when uh, they do certain interventions uh, to make sure that freedom of expression is, is uh, guaranteed uh, and to make sure that uh, um, yeah, human rights are respected. Uh, the second norm uh, will be uh, led by my colleague uh, Bruno Lete from uh, GMF, uh, will be on uh, critical infrastructure. So this UN norm uh, uh, is about how should states uh, protect critical infrastructure, what kind of uh, interventions can there be done uh, to make sure that our critical infrastructure is protected, how do we create a global cybersecurity culture. Um, and we have uh, Liga Rosenthal from uh, Microsoft who will be giving a bit of an input on this uh, to give you some ideas of, of um, one stakeholder's uh, uh, role in this. Um, and then the third uh, will be uh, um, on reporting ICT vulnerabilities, led by my colleague uh, Laura, if you can stand up, Laura, uh, from the GMF. Um, and this uh, norm has been about um, how do states make sure that vulnerabilities actually get reported, uh, that all the bugs, all the, the, the critical uh, uh, fallacies in uh, our IT systems, um, how do they uh, actually get patched? Um, so that's with Lara on the side. And then on the, as a last uh, uh, norm, we want to talk about uh, supply chain security. Um, so making sure that uh, the, the chain uh, in our technical systems is protected, uh, that there are no back doors. Um, and this will be led by my colleague, uh, Julia Scheutze from uh, the SMV. Um, so I would say, do you have any questions? But I think it's uh, um, best to uh, direct your questions towards our, our moderators, unless you have questions about the divisions. Um, so I think our, our moderators will go to their respective corners. Um, and I would like to ask, it's going to be very interactive. So we're really looking forward to your input. Um, and I would like to ask to maybe divide yourself a bit uh, towards the norm that you uh, have interacted with. So to repeat, human rights there, critical infrastructure there, reporting ICT vulnerabilities here, and uh, protecting the supply chain here. Critical infrastructure, human rights, okay. supply chain security, okay. and oh, reporting oh. vulnerabilities. Okay. Could you switch this one out? Because this is mine, I think. Oh, no. Says critical infrastructure. Oh, shit. Sorry. Mm. Just, back yeah, yeah. Yeah. Just take off the one blue one.
Blowing is called out here. Uh, you know, often academia find vulnerabilities. Um, I never quite thought of it as whistleblowing. <laughs> yeah, we can also call it monitoring. Uh, more broadly, see what was going on. I think it's accountability. It's a sense of accountability. I think that's because any system based on trust needs mechanisms for accountability. And whistleblowing maybe is a loaded. Well, it's a loaded word. Yeah, it's a. It's really about accountability. You know, our, you know, if there's a vulnerability there, is, is, is it aware? Um, some of the work that we do, you know, some of the roles we do, we, we continue to help coordinate, uh, though there are many other organizations in the U.S. now that, that do coordination. Um, and so that's, that's good. But we also try to improve the process, because at the end of the day, why are you disclosing vulnerabilities? What's the purpose of the value of society? Well, the value of society is so they can mitigate risk. <laughs> because we're trying to decide, you know, do I, do I, which vulnerabilities should I be aware of, which ones should I uh, actually do something about. I have limited resources, I can't solve all the problems. Uh, and, and so the disclosure process is meant to help, you know, part of what we do is how, how do you better incorporate that into risk management? Uh, so like the, the NIST risk, policies and disclosure norms um, more informative. Because that's the real challenge. Is, uh, it turns out, unfortunately, that there are a lot of vulnerabilities. Um, the the CVE database probably has about a quarter million vulnerabilities. Um, those are the ones that have been discovered. Those are the ones that have been reported. If you do some back of the envelope calculations, you look at some research papers, you know, the actual number is, uh, it's, it's hard to be, it's hard to be uh, modest about the number. You know, millions, trillions, billions, it's a lot. Uh, in part because software historically has not been written uh, to not have vulnerabilities. And so the, the density of vulnerabilities is much higher than people actually acknowledge. But it's a good thing if we have a process for identifying them, for disclosing them, and doing it doing it in a coordinated way. Um, and a big part of you know it, it's part of responsible disclosure because that's a uh, that's a part of the word in the uh, in the norm is responsible disclosure. It means that you verified that it's a vulnerability. It means that you developed a remediation, a way to fix, not not to to mitigate uh, the vulnerability, so it can't be. And then you've actually verified that that remediation is safe. It doesn't cause or induce disruption. Um, and then you write a, a high quality uh, advisory. And unfortunately, a lot of the advisories are not high quality. The vulnerability may not have been verified. There may be no fix reported. Uh, and that's a real problem right now uh, with the poor quality. And so that's part of the work that we also do uh, going forward. Sorry, the poor quality of the reporting? Of advisory. So there's record, there's, there's the initial report of a vulnerability, um, and then there's kind of a, there's an, I, there's an ISO process, but there's an ISO standard for how do you take that in, validate it, uh, figure out what the remediation is, uh, and then this, this 
support on it. Quality of advisory varies widely, and that makes it less useful for, from a risk management framework. That if you have an advisory that doesn't uh, doesn't help you manage your risk better, it's not really much. It's not it's not of much success. So that's a, that's a good question. Thank you. Incidents that we were recently involved in, whether it be uh, the meltdown, uh, uh, meltdown vulnerability in the, in the Intel software and the Intel hardware, and uh, we, we we had a limited role in it. But at one point, we were asked to validate that this was an actual exploit. It's a fairly technically complex exploit, and it took us you know about four days to really wrap our heads around it, understand what it was, uh, realize. What you could do with it and document it in a way so that you know, people on the outside would trust what we're saying. Because again, most people, you know, you and I aren't going to go out and try to try to, to technically validate it. We don't have time or uh, the skills necessarily. So that that validation part is really important and, and one of the more difficult parts. Because if you're a vendor, you have limited you don't necessarily want to communicate to everybody how what the real details are, but someone still needs to validate it. Someone still needs to validate it.
a little bit because I work in uh, programming and I'm doing it, so I was pretty pressured to call cyber, uh, especially when it comes to disclosing vulnerabilities on, on the side of, of the Facebook Pixel problem. And what do I mean by that? When we talk about the disclosure of vulnerabilities, a lot of problems that come through is that there's a huge amount of confidence in the system in the sense that less people that company knows that those products are capable of producing vulnerabilities because they are constantly in audit and constantly in audit anyway. And when someone like a researcher discovers a vulnerability and throws a vulnerability at least somebody's backlash, and usually it's some backlash not only for the for the part of the company but also other institutions. And this is the unfortunate problem that we see in academia is this University of California, San Diego, they did something that uh, we didn't expect, which I think was really interesting, in which we pose a vulnerability on servers in one of the servers, and we call it the app service, and we try to coach people to see whether or not they're able to report a vulnerability if they want to use there. And what happened? Most of the students, they discovered the vulnerability, but they didn't report it, and they were afraid of backlash from the other associates. So, and these, they, these are my points that they are pretty much committed. So the challenge is that uh, I put it here was like a conflict of interest, usually not only from uh, civil society, but also uh, stakeholders, like company, organization. Um, one of the problems, so, um, one of the rules that we try to decide is that I try to foment the, the, the research by creating some bounty, uh, like bounty programs, which is fairly common.
Asian. Uh, so, uh, unlike 10 years ago, nowadays, one vulnerability in, for example, open SSL, open from library, will affect, uh, it could be a software, browser, uh, maybe my gaming console, it's just from SSL card, and you know this. And all of these products must be updated or fixed at the same time or same time or similar time. So that's why we need uh, multi-party, multi-party coordinated project. And the process was initiated a few months ago at ISO. It will take over probably five to six years. So uh, we participate in this initiative. And my issue is pretty similar to what Christian already mentioned. Government provides and boundary information. Uh, symptoms of the cause. I mean, I'm, I'm always fascinated with how eager people are to, you know, set up certs and, and you know, have monitoring and detection and all of that. When, you know, if they focused a bit more on writing better software, you know, that would help.
Because if they're not educated, then they won't help find the resources. Well, I think that's all Researchers need to make the security mechanisms more efficient and easier to use. policymakers are aware and engaged in making some policy decisions that they'll eventually become better.
fact, um, they are used very little. I mean, most of the things that are being exploited are because, well, they didn't fix the known vulnerabilities. So, you know, if you're, whether you're a criminal or a nation state, you have no incentive to use something complex with, you know, and, and the whole, the whole Malpecha issue was, uh, you know, lack of patching, the whole you know, ransomware issue, lack of patching. Now it goes back to lack of resources for small companies to, to do things, but it's not, it's not because the prob those problems exist not because there were vulnerability disclosures. I mean, vulnerabilities were disclosed. Advisories were reasonable. There were mitigation, there were known mitigations out there, and people did not, did not or were not able to. I'm quite impressed at the technical quality, you know, the technical skill level we actually have here. I mean, that's, you know, five years ago it was difficult to get that. that just the people in a small group.
around the country, so they actually went to, you know, to make everybody come to D.C. or to New York to have a participation. So it's about holding these workshops throughout the country, um, and not always in big cities, uh, to encourage a lot of, you know, more diverse input in, into what they create as a national brand. I think that's really interesting. The dissemination, the idea of the capital.
All right, everyone, if I can have your attention. Uh, I heard a lot of interaction. Um, we're going to have to wrap up. Uh, so take two, mi two more minutes to uh, hear what the key takeaways are. But uh, I would like to ask everyone to put the chairs kind of back in place uh, and then uh, present per group what your main findings are. Uh, it doesn't have to be long, five to 10 minutes, because we need to evacuate uh, by 35. Um, <laughs> <laughs> hey, sorry for putting you on the spot. Uh, thanks for putting the chairs also back in place because there will be a, another session right after ours and uh, it'll make it a bit easier. There's another session at 40. At 40? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we do have some time? We have half an hour. Okay, so I don't have to like keep you. No, no. I need to read my notes. It's very tricky. Was it a good discussion? Yes, it was very good. I'm glad uh, Olaf uh, I, I yeah. saw him there. I mean, I probably had an easier job because it was yeah. I think uh, it went quite well with everyone, actually. Yeah. I think uh, Kate had a hard time because we're indeed a lot of people. All right. 
Um, all right, um, I will start by introducing some of the discussions and highlights that we had in our group. Um, our norm was ICT uh, supply chain security. We had a small group. Um, our main stakeholders were um, civil society, private sector, tech community. So we were um, missing, um, I guess, government. Um, so overall, um, the discussion we found that even though we come from different uh, stakeholders and we are come from um, different angles, if we look at it from a very high level, we do find consensus at least among these, um, these groups. Um, and uh, I will go through a little bit of um, the roles that we're seeing and some actions that these stakeholders were taking. So for opinion shapers, um, if you have private sector and the technical sector, um, there's a lot of developing um, opinion and then spreading the opinion. Um, uh, towards mostly uh, government, but also towards the public. And that was one of the challenges that technical community had, for example, to reach, um, um, to create security conscious uh, consumers as well. So some of the opinions um, and the, the rules and uh, things that need to be implemented are actually um, really small actors that are consumers, so how would you reach them? Um, then for government sometimes, um, also creating um, yeah, a consciousness about um, security and having a security mindset and what that means um, could be a challenge. Uh, for rule making, um, we uh, did come up with some rules. So for example, we should have a vulnerability equity process, but then these stakeholders who were in the group, for example, technical community um, or uh, private sector and civil society are not necessarily the ones who can actually implement the rule. So that's um, a challenge they see. Um, then we also saw though that if you say, for example, vulnerability equity process is something important, is an important rule, um, we, we take uh, some of these, the technical community or private sector took, um, for example, other norm actions where multi-stakeholders are involved, involved like, a Paris, like the Paris call, would use that. Um, or they would implement their rules themselves by, for example, creating trusted processes or contracts and audits. Um, so when companies among each other work together, they implement um, security that way. Um, then when we're looking at problem solving, um, there were quite some actions also on creating awareness among small and medium sized um, companies also for hardware security. Um, we do see a lot of also capacity building work uh, to reach actors that way. And um, yeah, I think that was one of the main outcomes that um, in the communities we are talking about, technical communities, civil society, government, private sector, um, that we have at the Internet Governance Forum, those people here who are having already the tech perspective and they are getting together. Um, but we actually also need to reach out to people who are not um, knowledgeable yet on tech, and, but they also need to create a way of understanding that because they would also make the rules in other platforms. And um, yeah, one idea was that to bridge this gap, um, for example, um, there could be um, tools that would explain the, the meaning of using tech for entrepreneurs or startups. So the entrepreneur would also understand what does supply chain security mean for me. Um, so is there some kind of guide of how I can assess this? Um, also for politicians to assess like what rule yeah, what rules will I need to take into account? What other policy fields would this affect? Um, so this was a discussion we had more broadly because if you get into the nitty gritty of supply chain, um, we need to have these kind of translation tools, workshops, uh, guidelines. Um, and then other, one other aspect was that uh, multi-stakeholder formats in general are very important, but sometimes the investment is not there. So for example, if you say, um, as a gov if government says like you should have, um, you should t put emphasis on open source, um, and you need, <laughs> you need um, uh, to have access then to the technical community uh, of the open source uh, software, 
they also need to provide the investment and resources so you can do that. Or if you're working on a solution on um, or creating a wool on, on supply chain or assessing risks of your supply chain, you, it's not just the wool that's necessary, but it's also the resources to um, really bring these people together who can then assess um, staff costs, all this, um, these things. So those were kind of baseline um, yeah, <laughs> summary. I hope I did it a little bit of justice. Um, yeah, thank you. <laughs> Thanks very much, uh, Julia. Um, who, who else feels uh, ready? Which group? The critical infrastructure group? Who's going to report? Mm -hmm. Uh, Are they walking? No, let's see if that one works. Ken is okay. So we'll actually bring it next to our paper here. So I'm Christian, I'm with the Government of Canada. I'm based in the mission in Geneva and... I'm Kian Posada. <laughs> I'm Kian Posada and I work at the World Trade Organizations. So we focus on critical infrastructure, and I'm going to highlight two points that I've noted. The first one is on inclusivity, and we propose some solutions. So I'm going to do all the computer. So one solution will be, for example, that uh, governments facilitate the, the, the participation of non-government stakeholders in rule and opinion making. For example, paying the fees or letting them that they are important. So changing a bit the culture, not just letting the government to lead the initiatives, but also the private sector. Um, we talk about public consultation in norm and opinion making by governments, so that it, it ensures um, inclusivity. And we mentioned as well a platform such as, such as the IGF, but also national initiatives or platforms to ensure this inclusive participation of non-government non -government, government stakeholders. That's for point number one on inclusivity and point number two on the enforcement, which I think it's on whistleblowing, that's how you call it. Um, for this one, it's, uh, we mentioned the legal protection aspect. Um, whistleblowing has to be protected from a legal perspective and um, also procedures to follow up on those uh, whist um, whistleblowing cases. So namely sanctions, for example. Um, we mentioned cooperation between non-government actors uh, in uh, identifying and assessing risk uh, uh, related to secret critical sec um, infrastructure security and cooperation between non-government and governments uh, in those uh, risk assessments as well. Uh, we mentioned the case of the Cyber Peace Institute for this kind of cooperation between non-government um, stakeholders. All right, so um, on uh, problem solving, um, we uh, looked at uh, how uh, the stakeholders can help, you know, between each other um, and find stakeholders that have a uh, common interest. Um, and I'll just go quickly back to also community building and in terms of, uh, of, of things that stakeholders are currently doing, uh, you know, the, the tech accord and uh, the community that is being built around the Paris call um, were, uh, were specifically examples of of how stakeholders get there um, create the community and then and then this can drive pressure on governments to to take certain actions and uh, and 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 engage in in, in, in conversations um, but towards the end of our presentation we sort of asked ourselves like how are any of these things specific to critical infrastructure uh, because, frankly, they could apply to, to, to many things. And, and some of the things that came out is that, well, for one thing, critical infrastructure um, is critical. So, so the information around what's going on there is not necessarily easily shareable, uh, easily accessible to the community for them to then um, uh, inform the discussions or influence the discussions. So we asked ourselves that there was a way to, you know, when you have a government running a water purification plant, well, what, you know, it, it is very critical because if it breaks down, then you, you have lives at stake, possibly. Uh, you can, um, if, it's a, if it's a malicious act by a foreign actors, you may, you, may, you may go to war over something like this. So, so the community, the stakeholders at large,
charge might not necessarily have an insider view or inside the critical infrastructure. They might not have an insider view on how the infrastructure is set up, how who who runs the data. Um, but uh, so 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 it was kind of an obstacle to our to our discussion in the end. Um, but you know. I, I think that it is important that the community gets involved in the community, uh, into the critical infrastructure aspect, because specifically because it is uh, it is critical. It depends on you know their livelihood can actually depend on 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 whether or not they you know go through the day if the critical infrastructure fails. So there needs to be really uh, strong engagement and oversight by the by the non-government stakeholders in this area. So I think that's all I have. You, good. Okay, that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for this overview, and uh, thanks for uh, involving other initiatives as well uh, in um, uh, your discussion. Um, maybe, uh, yeah, uh, on ICT vulnerabilities, uh, I'll give the floor. Okay, um, so I'll just do the three key points I think that we came up with uh, in our discussions. One was that ultimately we were quite positively surprised that progress had been made um, on a responsible and coordinated vulnerability disclosure over the last 30 years when the idea was first brought up. Um, as a thing, we had people from four continents um, in our group, so it's clearly recognized as a global issue. We know that some of the large corporations have implemented CVD processes. Um, the big barrier that we came up with, actually the two big barriers that we came up with was one, um, no real solution has been found to how to overcome the inherent conflict of interest that is there in vulnerability disclosure, um, in that no corporation likes to hear that the products they have put out are really flawed, um, and they are inherently questioning the motives of the people that report to them. Um, and the second um, really important one is that Ultimately, what vulnerability disclosure focuses on is still just addressing the symptom rather than the root cause. Because uh, the reason that we still find loads of vulnerabilities in products and services is that secure development as a process is still not being implemented correctly and there is not enough attention being paid um, to that. So that, I guess, could really be turned into a call for a new norm on secure development um, and the education around it. Um, and then the sort of the underlying issues around all that, um, some of them we've heard about in terms of education of policymakers and greater dialogue between technologists um, and policymakers, um, all boiling down to the fact that if you speak to a political decision maker, they still don't really understand how the internet works and that they, yet, yet they are trusted with um, making decisions about how those technologies should be governed and regulated. Um, so really a call to everyone in the room to just find a common language um, on which, in which uh, to communicate um, about why technology matters, why security matters, um, and how it should be addressed. Um, and the third, perhaps slightly controversial bit um, around the norm and how it is being implemented by states at the moment, because the norm clearly says that ICT vulnerability should be disclosed yet we know that there are states buying off the market and stockpiling their own vulnerabilities for future use against their adversaries, perhaps forgetting in the process that because the systems we use are shared across the globe, they might be equally badly affected if it all goes wrong. Um, and I'll just leave that as that. Does that do it justice, group? Thank you. Thank you. And as our last, uh, we, we have some time left, so uh, um, we can also maybe still open the floor for some questions afterwards. But uh, as last, I would like to uh, ask the human rights group um, to also uh, share their findings. Great. Um, I've got a mic here, so I'll just stay here. And our sheet fell off, which I hope is not um, symbolic of what's happening to human rights in the world, but I think it might be. Um, so our um, norm is focused on the need to promote and protect human rights online or in cyberspace. And we had a range of stakeholders represented in our group from the tech community, um, from NGOs, and also from um, the private sector. 
And we came up with quite a few roles that are already being played by those groups in supporting the implementation of this norm. So one that came across a lot was providing an evidence base um, for um, what is happening when it comes to human rights um, in, in terms of the, for example, legislation that is developed and passed by states in the name of promoting cybersecurity, ensuring that the links between human rights and security are clear, um, uh, doing research and being able to provide, like I said, an evidence base for the, Im for the impact of, the, of measures on, on individuals is a key role that think tanks and NGOs play. Um, another thing that uh, our group has been doing is hosting multi-stakeholder processes and forums to ensure that these discussions are inclusive. Um, and translating these norms at the international level to different stakeholder groups and also to the national level and national context, which is really key, if they're actually going to go anywhere. Um, so there's a wide range of um, things that uh, different stakeholders are doing to implement the human rights norm, um, mainly focused around research, monitoring, um, and um, um, ensuring inclusive processes. So we did have quite a few challenges as well. The one that really came out that everyone wanted to highlight was the lack of coherence between um, international rules and principles and law um, and national level regulatory frameworks, as well as the very important role of private sector policies in this space and how those things don't always square, um, and there's a lack of harmonization between them that really causes issues um, for all stakeholders in ensuring that human rights are upheld um, globally. So I hope I did that some justice. <laughs> I don't know if anyone from the group wanted to uh, jump in there to add anything. Thanks. Thanks, Chital. And I didn't realize I have a mic here. That's actually a lot handier. <laughs> um, so um, we still have five minutes left, actually, for discussion. I don't know if this is a, a, a bit of an appropriate format since we've uh, just been in a small group. Um, but I was just wondering if there are any um, challenges that you um, are facing as a stakeholder that today you've gotten some insight on uh, um, how to tackle them or uh, some cooperation um, with other stakeholders that you've met today? Um, just open question. Well, in any case, um, I, I do think it's a valuable discussion that we should be having uh, more often. The fact that all these stakeholders are involved um, means that it's not just a matter of states uh, choosing how to implement these norms. Every stakeholder has a role to play, uh, and I think that became clear through the workshop um, that we're already doing doing a lot. There's already a lot of actions being taken. Um, I've seen uh, from your interactions that uh, there, there is a lot of um, ideas floating around, uh, stuff going on, uh, cooperations already happening, um, and challenges across the board um, that we are all facing that need maybe some time, but also some, some effort and motivation um, to come together and to work on this together. Um, I think Platforms like the IGF um, are a good place to start this discussion, um, but we shouldn't stop at just influencing opinions. Um, I think implementation of, of uh, solutions and, and observing these norms uh, are, I think, the next step in this whole process. Um, I hope you also um, are now a bit more aware of the UN processes. I, I heard a bit of a deferring knowledge level uh, of what's actually happening, uh, and I think it's, it's good to realize that what's happening at a UN level is also happening at a, a national level, at a local level, uh, and these are discussions that we're all having um, as we are trying to protect uh, this digital space. Um, I hope you also then uh, keep following this discussion, uh, keep interacting, and uh, keep pushing yourself into this space. Uh, I think it's important uh, for all the stakeholders, but also for our, um, uh, uh, our stakeholder, the European Union, um, to uh, involve everyone in this. Um, a bit of a word also on the EU CyberDirect project. Uh, Julia also introduced it already, but um, what we really try to accomplish is bringing this cyber diplomacy idea, bringing these people to the table, uh, gathering multiple perspectives, and making sure that the, um, the norms uh, 
follow through and, and, and leak through to all the levels. Um, and I hope to see you at other events of ours and that we can keep this uh, conversation going. Thank you. Yeah, I suddenly realized this is not a bad idea. Yeah. Uh, hey, thanks for your Ja, man kann sich halt beruflich mal ein bisschen mehr kennenlernen und auch so 